My name is Shabashis Ball, and I'm now going to refer to my notes to remind me who I am. Um, I, I have a degree in ba uh, Bachelor of Mathematics in 1990, an ancient background in physics and statistics and mathematics, and some computer science. I have a 25-year uh, IT career that covers application development, networking, and security. I'm currently on the owner and CEO of 6279040 Canada Incorporated. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank you know, Skull Space and Papers We Love um, for you know, having me present this paper, and uh, which is Petchum, a new platform for distributed machine learning on big data. Um, at this point, I'd like to make my apologies, which is if you notice my name and you know, com uh, company name, all that is in this dark blue. I'd like to apologize to the writers of the paper and all sorts of intelligent, gene, very intelligent, very hardworking people on the internet whom I've blatantly plagiarized from. You will be able to recognize my own work from the dark blue that I've written my own name in. Everything else is largely copied and pasted from either the original authors of the paper, who, uh, I've taken entire slides from their presentation, or, uh, which will be a completely different format from this slide, and everything else you know, copied and pasted. I was going to make it sort of a challenge to the audience here to guess what I've written, to find what I've written, and give them a robin's egg. But I now apologize for that because you know, uh, the people at the office ate all my robin's eggs. So I will now continue with the subject matter. So what is machine learning? Um, a widely accepted definition is uh, Mitchell's definition of machine learning. The field of machine learning is concerned with the question of how to construct computer programs that automatically improve the experience. The, what, I, um, well, I think it's very important to introduce this one definition, although the audience may be very well familiar with this, is the identification of three key variables. Experience, uh, E, tasks, and performance measure, P. Um, I ask that you keep these in mind as I explain this paper from a slightly different view than uh, most people in the machine learning industry do because I'm very, very largely removed from it. Um, my background, as I refer to, uh, I'm a purchaser of consumer technology and implementer. And what I will, the aspect and uh, perspective I will bring to uh, present in this paper is why would someone want to implement this particular product? The authors of this paper are clearly from the Pe uh, Petchum side, um, and they extol its virtues. My question is that do we really understand this paper and its virtues? So, continuing on with the definition of machine learning, uh, an algorithmic perspective. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to read through pages and pages of slides. I want to get these definitions out of the way. What I do want to draw your attention to is this part right here. Uh, the interesting features of machine learning, da 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 da, is often missing from computer science undergraduates. The statistical and mathematical sophistication is often missing uh, from computer science uh, undergraduates. So, no, I'm not going to resolve this situation by going to details of the mathematics. What I will do is identify some of the areas which are mathematical principles as. Uh, to differentiate them from computer or technology principles. And therefore, if there's some lack of understanding, we identify this as lack of understanding of mathematics as opposed to computer technology. So now, uh, to further identify, you know, define machine learning, I think this Venn diagram is very useful because uh, it showed, throws in hacking skills, which explains why it's being, this is being done at skull um, you know, So it's the intersection of hacking skills, math and statistics knowledge, and substantive uh, expertise. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that machine learning is actually outside of the, uh, the body of substantive expertise. I can live up to that. I am outside the body of substantive expertise. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> so now the thing is that the types of machine learning problem, 
Oops. Now, once again, um, I, I don't believe that you know you guys should have to read through all these slides. What I'm saying, what I'm trying to show here is that there are various machine learning problems. They are well defined. I've highlighted clustering and rule extraction because I believe that these are the areas that are focused on in this paper. Ten examples of machine learning problems. I've shown you five. The reason that one slide isn't big enough, and I don't believe that we need to go through every possible example. Just know that there's, you know, there's a uh, machine learning has many uses, many important uses: credit card fraud detection, spam detection, facial recognition. So finally, focusing on the paper. What is Petio? Or uh, a colleague once said perhaps it's Petio. It's a distributed machine learning framework. It aims to provide a generic, algorithmic, and systems interface to large scale machine learning. It takes care of difficult systems. Um, basically, it's a, it does the hard work for you. You don't have to build a machine learning uh, platform. Uh, it takes, you know, you can set this up on uh, Amazon. Uh, Google, I hope to be able to implement it on uh, uh, Azure, Microsoft's cloud platform. Okay, so this is the Petium architecture ecosystem. So there's a machine learning application library that's provided, and the, the bulk of this paper focuses on this side. Um, it's, it's a very uh, it's strongly reliant on the Apache suite of uh, clustering products, but it does not rule out the use of a standalone cluster operation, which, going back to my own background in terms of my customers, um, they are looking for private cloud solutions. So this is something that I can pitch. Intrinsic properties. So I draw your attention to these three areas. Error tolerance, dynamic structural dependency, and non-uniform convergence. The reason why I identify these areas is that these translate very well to mathematics. Um, error tolerance and non-uniform convergence are are basically you know pure mathematical terms. So I'm uh, just pointing out the dynamic structural dependency. What this is is uh, that. The, the, the dynamic structural dependency refers to sensitivity of a coefficient. It's, so these three directly map to mathematical concepts. So when, when we are trying to uh, optimize on these conditions, we are introducing purely mathematical concepts. Okay. The white slides are the ones that are taken directly from the uh, presentation that the authors uh, did on this very paper at uh, 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 Data Science Consort uh, Conference. So, now, what I'm, this, this is their Petrium solution. Now, what I'm going to draw your attention to is the bottom portion of this slide. Networks, they, I don't know whether this was their intention, but really what they've done is that, okay, there's, you know, there's a network side to it, there's a computing computer side to it, or cloud computing. So server machines, graphical uh, processing units, desktops, laptops, new machines, these two areas, network. And you know, as of, since I haven't spoken to these authors, what I can infer from this slide is that no matter how, you know, what your computing architecture, whatever, we're going to parallelize it and get it working for you. Going back to this uh, diagram, the two areas that this uh, paper focuses on is the data parallel model, voice and data parallel engine, and the model parallel API, the, the Strats model parallel engine. So what does a machine, uh, machine learning programmer need? Basically, they've created you know, there are these considerations, batch size, partition model, when to sync up. Um, I find that See, given that this is a human presentation, these are all things that essentially can be read from the manual in terms of, okay, you're doing a big data problem. Does data batch size matter? Well, 
Let's go back to the definition of the problem. Of course it does. It goes without saying. So um, I just want to show that the uh, authors have identified these as issues. Now, this is another breakdown of how Petrum works. Um, there are workers that do the processing, and there's a scheduler and a parameter exchange channel. Uh, the parameter server can you know, basically balance out which parameters are, are worked upon. And the scheduler sets the priority. That's my basic understanding of it. I may be uh, wrong in that regard. Now, they have gone to the trouble of defining essentially the Petrium program structure. There's a schedule method, a push method, and a pull method. Um, since we work on iterative pro processes, draw attention to the update uh, uh, methods within it. You'll find that when you design uh, your problems, you create iterative processes around these update methods. So, you know, going back to definitions here, data parallelism. So, I, I've you know, put there a formal definition of it. But essentially what uh, data parallelism is, is that you are um, uh, basically splitting the data and working on it in parallel. The, the model demonstrated in this paper is distance metric learning. Now this is once again a very formal algorithm that can be investigated and, and, uh, and, and studied further. So now I'm going into the mathematics here. Stochastic gradient descent. This is an optimization method. This is the method that's used in the, the uh, yeah. Distance, uh, let me just backspace here. The distance metric learning uh, algorithm. So, gradient descent. This is a first order optimization algorithm to find a local minimum of a function. And the reason why I've bothered to really drill down on this definition is that this is now referring to the mathematics taught at the undergraduate level. First order means that if you're using any derivatives, so on and so forth, you don't have to go to that second uh, order. Or if you're, you're talking about polynomials, it's, it's a linear equation in terms of it will be a formula uh, y is equal to mx plus b, where m and b are constants, and x and y represent your data. So the data parallel pseudocode. So if you notice that basically schedule and the pull method are empty. So in, a, in terms of implementation, if I want to experiment with this, I'm going to choose the data parallel uh, uh, algorithms, the data, the data parallel solution, because I only have to work with the push method. So in terms of, you know, when I'm deploying my technology, is it working? Did I fail to plug it in, et cetera? Let's test it out using the data, data parallel method. So data parallel stochastic gradient descent. Once again, the hard mathematics that I won't delve into. But what it's essentially saying is showing you the math behind optimizing that, that the, uh, the uh, pension will go through to optimize your equations. I draw your attention to the, you know, the, uh, the actual you know, nice pictogram here, um, where it shows the input data is split, goes into the local copy, copies of all the parameters, processed and then it's aggregated uh, and then you update all the parameters. Now, um, th this may seem obvious and simple. It's not because, see what we're talking about is uh, deploying an algorithm over a large data set and getting a solution, except we're going to get this done quickly by splitting up the data. Yes? This looks kind of similar to MapReduce. They do refer to MapReduce in the paper. So uh, this may be very uh, like similar to that. Piece. So the uh, this, just to um, to use as um, an analogy, I've worked on data problems, not big data problems, where uh, I'm running the entire formula on top, on top of a large data set. But if I change the data from five years ago, it changes my answer for, for yesterday. So in other words. If this is not aggregated properly, this doesn't work. So 
being able to you know, design the system so that it does implement, uh, like work on a solution by splitting up the data and then combining it, is a problem that needs to be overcome and overcome correctly. So how to speed up data parallels? So really, um, I, I think that most readers of this paper are, are not going to this level of detail. What I, I get from this is that they do explain the principles involved. Now these are computing principles. Well, co uh, an overlap of mathematics and computing. Um, there are many papers on these definitions of bounding, asynchronous, parallelism, spread the network, communications evenly, don't sync unless needed. So they've designed protocols that don't require synchronizations. If you look at the history of machine learning and algorithm, uh, development of these algorithms, there's a time when they must be very tightly synchronized. They found ways to make the synchronization of less importance. This means that when you configure your technology, the need to synchronize the working of solutions becomes less important. So the data parallel engine. So what the reason why you know I'm showing that like uh, Boson is a very formalized. Uh, server, it's, it, it's something that, you know, it, it's not a uh, abstract idea, it's a formal set of solutions, right? And they're, they've chosen that model for their data parallel solutions. So the thing is that there's a single machine uh, solution and a distributed. And of course what they're essentially showing on these slides, which still don't come out well, is basically how, how they perform and, you know, obviously they perform better with more machines, more threads are used. High performance consisting models for fast data parallels. How am I doing for time? That's my cheating way to take a break. Yeah, I do it by starting at about uh, 40 after it's 654. Okay. So um, they bring in various concepts to basically me measure the quality of the, the performance. The, uh, stale, synchronous, parallel. Um, basically, that's the methodology by which they're s distributing the data uh, processing. And of course, the mathematics behind it. What they're, um, they're, this is the convergence theorem that's being applied here. Um, stochastic uh, gradient uh, P. My notes here, SGP. Well, um, too many notes. Stochastic gradient descent. Uh, this is the mathematics behind it. It's once again well defined. So if you are curious about this area of how and why it's working, you can do your further research there. So we move on to model parallelism. That's splitting the model. In, in this case, they're referring to graphical processing units. It doesn't necessarily have to be graphical processing units, but just processors. And the model parallel model, the uh, algorithm they use is the lasso algorithm that's demonstrated in this paper. So once again, this is a it's a, um, a a different kind of problem. Rather than splitting up the data amongst many machines, what we're going to do is we're going to cut up our processing model. Uh, mathematically, this is a much more sophisticated problem because what it's essentially saying is that, okay, if we're just to use a, a linear example, um, we are going to do 3x squared plus sine x. Well, we're going to get one machine to do the 3x squared, the other machine to do sine x. And of course, in a much more complicated model, if one part depends on the other part, well, how are you going to separate that? Now, the thing is that. This is where the mathematical sophistication, like the knowledge of mathematics is very important because there are various methods of s splitting uh, mathematical problems. So I, I go on to further explain, you know, put more, more in depth into the lasso algorithm because the paper spends a lot of time on it. Um, so, these are the, like basically it's a least squares 
uh, uh, model, which means that basically you have an ideal solution, you have data that is supposed to represent it. You take the square of the difference between the two and find a model that minimizes the sum of those squares. And as I said, it's very well defined. You know, you basically, you know, I will provide the links to these sites, but it's really unnecessary. You just start typing in these phrases. It will actually take you right to wherever I uh, plagiarized it from. So computation of the lasso solutions. Um, the computation of the last solution is a quadratic programming problem. Now, identify this because quadratic programming, once again, a very well-defined area. If you want to solve something, you don't even have to know how to do it. You can Google it, refer to textbooks. You'll have hundreds of examples that will you know, fit your condition. And why you want to go deeper is that within the paper itself, it refers to these conditions. And why, why I do like the fact that it's clearly identified is that they imply there's a direct mapping between these fairly abstract mathematical concepts directly into their uh, application programming interface. So if you're a mathematician or you know, a statistician that is aware of uh, how your problem is modeled, you can then go to uh, uh, Petio and just look up the APIs and put it in there. There's, so there's less uh, work with the technologists on implementing it. The model parallel pseudocode. Now, if you notice, all three boxes are filled. The push, the pull, and the schedule. Scheduling is very important to, uh, to model parallelism because what you need to do is calculate certain portions of the model first, and it may not be the same portion every time. And that is why, you know, um, you know, setting up the parameters to prioritize which parts of the model get uh, solved is important. And that is where what happens at your schedule. So this is structure-aware parallelization, once again, a formal concept. And this is just showing how uh, it works where you have a series of workers that go through one round, then you go to the next round. This is where your scheduling is happening, round three, round four. Now, when I say that, when I'm tell, explaining these pictures to you, that is my understanding of the paper. I may be wrong. Different convergence theorem. Remember, I was saying that uh, you know, those three concepts, you know, uh, uh, non-uniform convergence. Studying convergence, how quickly we get to our solution, and you know, uh, is an important uh, metric to measure. And once again. They've gone through the mathematics, you know, keep going, E or P. So, um, like I said, this, uh, it's, it, it's, they have done their research on this, and you know, we aren't going to go to you know, the guts of the math. But what I'm saying is that it's there to be delved into. And this is their, their description of the model parallel engine. They used the Strads model. Sorry, I, you know, it wasn't on the picture. I didn't mention it. So we have the Boson data parallel model, and we've got Strat's model uh, parallel engine. Okay, challenges in model parallels. Now, I really like the, uh, the picture that they put, put up here because this speaks exactly to the mathematics I'm familiar with. Because what they're talking about is matrix calculations. Now, I don't know if anyone remembers their uh, second year linear algebra. But there are well-defined mathematical theorems that um, basically let you solve a large matrix by partitioning the matrix. And that is what we mean in the partition model. So really what they're looking for is if you can express your problem as a solution of a large matrix, they now they have methods to partition that matrix, give it to different machines to solve. So, so like, the thing is that we're seeing you know, the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of you know, your second year linear algebra can be applied to this very large, sophisticated computer science problem. So data versus model parallels. This is where I really do need to refer to my notes. Um, because you know, the, what, these are all these explanations 
uh, you know, comparing data parallelism and uh, uh, you know, model parallelism and the various advantages or disadvantages. Once again, I think I've, uh, they have these nice pictures describing what's happening here. But I, I think we've you know, covered it by explaining we split the data with model, model, data model parallelism and, and split the model with model parallelism. So the, the previous slide, I, it finally kind of clicked for me. So data, sorry, the one before that even. Um, so in model parallelism, everybody gets the same data and does a different part of the model? Absolutely. Uh, I'm glad you restated that because now I don't need my notes. The, the conclusion that I drew that I didn't bother to write in blue, and this is where you know, I'm selling this to my customer here, is that, see, with data uh, parallelism, what this means is that if, you, if, you're, if your uh, machine is distributed over a network, a slow network, you may favor data parallelism because you don't have to push the data over your network. So in the case where you have many cores, many processors sitting in the same room, you may want to do data parallelism because you don't have to spend any time sending that data around. If you do have that slow network, you may favor, uh, pardon me, yeah. uh, if you do have that fast network, your storage area network where you have access to all of the data, you may favor, favor model parallelism. And this case is that do you have a question? Here? Yeah, is, is that because like I, when you show the pseudocode, like the one has the model parallelism has the scheduling and the it's doing pushing and pulling, so it's doing both. Yeah, it's doing lots of processing, right? And it's a lot of chatting over the network, I assume. Um, well, not necessarily a lot of chatting, but there is. Um, it needs more feedback. Whereas it, with, with the well, think of it this way: How big can your model be compared to your data? considering that we're in the era of big data solutions. Okay. So even if you have to push an entire model to all your machines over a slow network, it probably is not going to take that long. But now you're talking about very large data sets. Do you really want to push all the data to every machine over this wide area or this large network? So in, in the case of having a slow network, slow back channel, you do data parallelism because you don't have to send as much data. Everyone has the same model. Right? In the, when you do have that fast network, you've got a storage area network that was that can serve all your data to all the machines, no problem. But you may not have a lot of fast machines. That in that case, you split up the model and have various machines work on some various parts of the model. And of course, the parameter server and scheduler manage that for you. So. Now we go into like basically the uh, comparison of uh, machine learning platforms. Um, as you can see, what we have here is the number of cores and the number of model parameters served. So in other words, the more um, uh, model parameters that you serve with the fewer number of cores, the better off you are. So in other words, if you are on this side of the graph, you're good. So if you look at all the Petium solutions, they are on this half of the graph, showing you that they are better solutions, which is, well, what can we expect from you know, people who are you know, pushing the suspension? So the most advantages. So one of the things that um, I have not had the time to do, you know, I'll, I'll take it for the word that, see, if you notice the uh, Boson solutions, are you know uh, basically on the good parts of the graph. It's still uh, a logarithmic scale, so it implies that it's faster. That it, what, what it shows that basically the Boson solution is better in all cases. I uh, the reason why I mentioned that I haven't verified is that I need to go through all these definitions to verify that in fact that is necessarily the good place to be. Which I did for the first graph. Not for the others. See this one is a little bit easier to see. Um, this is the Strad's model compared to uh, uh, the lasso um, repetitive regression. I believe. So this is Strad's versus uh, lasso repetitive regression. Yep. Uh, it's objective faster. 
beats Graph Lab, and beats the Yahoo LDA. Efficiency. So this is where essentially they're talking about how many machines that they're using. You know, so it's 20 times faster using lasso regression for generic assay analyses. These graphs actually show it um, more nicely. This is Petchin versus VLDA, Petchin versus Shotgun. Shotgun is a uh, lasso regression algorithm. It's one uh, expression of it. So high-speed model building and prediction. So this is what you know, uh, it's managed to do, 200 images per second on the G GPU machine. I, don't, I mean, it sounds pretty fast to me because I couldn't go through 200 images in a second, but you know, I don't have anything to compare it to, but this is you know, what they're pushing out. They're going on the record. You know, I'll take the word for it. So these are the various uses. You know, uh, you know, we use summarization, user profiling. Mm -hmm. And basically, they, they go on, like, this is the performance you know, over various machines. So, yes, four machines are better than one. Um, what I would like to look into is how significant, if you look at, you know, on the slow solutions, that the four machines are only, like, you know, are, are not necessarily significantly better than the, the one machine. So, you may draw a value in terms of the fact that, well, should you buy more machines to implement your Petrium solution? Well, it's not necessarily going to give you, get, make it that much better. So you really just have to look at whether the overall solution is good. Petrium lasso versus shotgun. Once again, you know, it's graph after graph showing that Petrium is better. Um, this one surprised me, is that Petrium was five times faster than the Yahoo LDA. Um, that's the uh, algorithm used in uh, language understanding. And it was twice as better as Spark in matrix factorization. Single machine versus Petrium. Once again, Petrium is better. And this is how much you know, faster Petrium is than the Yahoo LDA. That should be the last graph. So first of all, I'd, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the uh, people who actually wrote the paper, the people at Salem Lab, and who they've acknowledged. So I've just taken their acknowledgments from sheet, pasted in there. And then I would like to, once again, thank Skullspace and Papers We Love, uh, and of course, the people who wrote the paper. Cool. Thanks, Sean. graph theory, they really like it because they like to try, try to make every problem a graph theory problem. Mm -hmm. And I found that that is, you know, it's kind of intuitive to represent things as graph theory problems, but they're not necessarily fast. But then when you're saying, you know, that this kind of gives you kind of like a plug and play way to, if you can represent your problem as like, you know, s you know, solving a matrix or something like that, suddenly it's fast. Like that's really interesting. I had no idea. So oh, I'll really dig okay. Some more. Well, I'll speak to that a little bit. I'll, it may diverge from the paper, but See, what if, like, I, I'm familiar with like, you know, graph theorists loving graph theory. <laughs> See, I think that like, because graph theory comes from pictorial representations, mm -hmm. and that's the way human brains work. So the thing is that intuitively, when we solve problems, we visualize them. And then, of course, you know, the, the graph theory mathematicians, who, you know, they came from a uh, position of visualization. So therefore, well, whenever we see a problem, but I, I, I said it, we see a problem. Mm -hmm. So we've already visualized it. And of course, if we have techniques to put into formal mathematics, we get there. So we have got a robust field of mathematics. What I like about big data is that it does not have the bias of human senses, is that it is a collection of numbers. And what we do is we let the computer on it, and it has a body of mathematical techniques. And what it does is it says, we're going to throw all the mathematical techniques. We don't care what, whether the human visualized it or heard it or felt it. And the thing is that if we find that we can get you know, predictive results from these mathematical models, we're going to use them. And see, this is why uh, the model parallelism 
really fascinating uh, in terms of you will now have these mathematicians that say, how do we break up these models? Because in the days before computers, and in terms of mathematics, we're still there. Because we're still, humans are still thinking about doing math. They're thinking about solving math. But now what we're saying is that we don't even need to solve the problem. Can we partition it in such a way that calculating it in parts will solve the problem? If we can partition it, we can then put it in a machine learning environment, and the machine will solve the problem for us. Mm -hmm. 